Hi there everybody. This is continuing a series of videos on optical mineralogy and today we're going to talk about anisotropic materials in depth. Last time we talked about isotropic materials in depth and uh, the important take-homes to remember about isotropic materials are that they're defined by having a single index of refraction and this effectively prevents them from exhibiting pleochroism or the transmission of light with cross polarizers. If you can identify a substance as isotropic, you know that it has to be either one of the isometric minerals or an amorphous substance in order to exhibit that behavior. As you've probably guessed from me belaboring the point that isotropic materials are defined by a single index of refraction, anisotropic materials are going to be defined by multiple indices of refraction. And this is what allows them to exhibit pleochroism and the transmission of light under cross polarizers. So let's move on to the cool stuff now with anisotropic substances. So let's demonstrate how light interacts with anisotropic substances by using the classic example of a calcite rhombohedron in normal everyday light. So the first thing I'd like you to note is that we're looking in a very specific direction in this calcite crystal. Uh, this direction is associated with it laying on one of its cleavage faces and so it is laying on one of the faces that make up the 1,0 bar 1, 1 crystal form. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this dot and we're going to look at it through the calcite rhombohedron. Once again, no polariscope or fancy sources of light are going on in this example. And so looking at the dot through the calcite produces two images of the dot. So what on earth is going on here? Well, as light enters the anisotropic calcite, it is actually being split into two beams. Let's see if we can learn a little bit more about these beams by rotating the crystal. So as we rotate the crystal, hopefully you can notice that one of the images seems to stay in place while the other image rotates about it. The image of the dot that stays in place is called the ordinary ray, and the image of the dot rotating about it is called the extraordinary ray. Here's a little figure to illustrate that. So while we continue to rotate our calcite rhombohedron, I just want to talk a little bit about why calcite is really ideal for this experiment. The first reason is that the difference in the refractive indices with direction in calcite are rather extreme. And the second is that the orientation of the cleavage plane within the calcite crystal structure is almost perfect to maximize the separation between these two beams. We'll go more into depth on this in a later video, a focus just on calcite, but for now let's continue our experiment. So let's bring in a polarizing light filter and see if we can learn anything else about the ordinary and extraordinary rays. So I'm going to slowly rotate this uh, polarizing filter and hopefully we can see something interesting happen. So after rotating enough, I've completely eliminated the ordinary ray. Aha! That means the ordinary ray has to be polarized. Let's see what happens if I try and rotate 90 degrees from this position. And as we rotate 90 degrees, you can see the ordinary ray come back in a ghostly form. Both rays exist for a moment, and then the image of only the ordinary ray remain. Aha! The extraordinary ray is also polarized, and it's polarized in a perpendicular fashion to the polarization of the ordinary ray. We'll continue the rotation of this polarizing light filter and note that every 90 degrees results in the extinction of one of the rays and the following 90 degrees results in the extinction of the other. So when light enters an anisotropic material, it is going to be split into two beams and these beams are going to be polarized perpendicular to one another. So this is a classic way to do the uh, calcite experiment. Uh, but let's update it a little bit now that we have our fancy tablet polariscope. If you recall from before, when we were using our polariscope, we would actually be rotating the mineral in either plane or cross-polarized light. So let's do that now actually with our calcite. And you may ask yourself, why is that O sideways? Well, it's because in order to have my plane polarized light be vibrating in a north-south direction, that's how I had to orient my tablet. So this is an important thing to note if uh, you want to follow along with any of these experiments. Sometimes devices are polarized north-south and sometimes they're polarized east-west. So you have to have an idea of that uh, orientation first. Either that or just remember everything might be off by 90 degrees. So as you can see I've typed an O on our tablet which is going to be the 
base of our polariscope in plain polarized light. And now we'll bring in the calcite rhombohedron and see what happens to the O. Alrighty, so right off the bat, you can see that we're in an orientation where you can see both the extraordinary and ordinary rays. So let's rotate until one of them disappears. And so if you paid attention to our previous experiment, this experiment is going to work pretty similarly. The difference being that in the previous experiment, we had normal light traveling through the calcite, where it was being split into two beams, and then we uh, selectively move, removed portions of those beams based on the orientation of our upper polarizer. Here, the light entering the calcite is already plain polarized, and so only in certain orientations does the beam get split by the calcite. As with most things, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And this way is how we're going to be using our polariscope going forward. And now we're down to a single image of the O, and this is the uh, image that's not moving, so we're looking at only the ordinary ray. We keep spinning and bring back the extraordinary ray, and then we can see both rays uh, coexist for a bit, and then we can continue spinning until we're left with only the extraordinary ray. So here's the key thing about this. We're going to use our ability to see only the ordinary ray, or only the extraordinary ray, in order to figure out the optical properties of our minerals. So we'll keep spinning here to show you there's no uh, chicanery going on with the full 360 degree rotation of our calcite, but we're going to transfer now to how this relates to pleochroism. So we'll have to give our colorless calcite the boot. So next up on the docket is uh, the mineral tourmaline. And once again, it is important to note that I'll be orienting the tourmaline in a very specific direction. So here we have a crystal of tourmaline that we're viewing in plain polarized light. This tourmaline is going to be anisotropic, and so let's think about how the calcite example is going to inform what we see here with pleochroism. So the calcite example showed us that when light enters an anisotropic material, it'll be split into two beams that are vibrating in mutually per perpendicular directions. And we know from our previous example of rotating barrel that there are two pleochroic end member colors separated by 90 degrees of rotation. Let's take a quick look at what those colors are for our tourmaline. So we can see as we rotate the tourmaline that the color gradually darkens until it is almost completely dark. So you may be saying to yourself, hmm, it's kind of suspicious that every 90 degrees the color goes from a maximum to a minimum and every 90 degrees when we were rotating the calcite, we ended up with either the extraordinary or ordinary ray. And you'd be exactly correct that that is somewhat suspicious. Let's go a bit more into theory to explain why. So plane polarized light is light that is only vibrating in one plane. So if we were to look directly down the beam of light vibrating in that plane, it would look something like this. And, as we mentioned before, anisotropic substances are going to be defined by multiple indices of refraction. Our tourmaline is actually going to be described by two indices of refraction. So if we wanted to illustrate those two different indices of refraction, it would look something like this. Let's call one of the indices epsilon, and let's call the other omega. In this example, epsilon is less than omega, but that does not necessarily need to be the case but it does happen to be the case for both the calcite and tourmaline that we're looking at today. So if we imagine lining up our plane polarized light beam with our representation of the refractive indices of our crystal, we'd see that in this orientation, only epsilon will be shown. Basically, the plane polarized light would pass through the crystal being refracted by index epsilon. Now, let's make the same diagram for rotating our crystal 45 degrees. So our crystal rotates, and the plane polarized light direction stays the same. So in this instance, because the plane polarized light is not directly lined up with one of our refractive indices, what's actually going to happen is that it's going to split into two beams vibrating in perpendicular directions, one associated with epsilon and one associated with omega. This corresponds to the orientations of calcite where we saw multiple images earlier in plane polarized light. Now let's rotate another 45 degrees, a full 90 degrees from our initial starting position. Here we see that the vibrational direction of our plane polarized light is going to line up with omega, and so the plane polarized light will travel through the crystal, being refracted by index omega. So, if we look at all three diagrams, we see 
that in every 90 degrees, one position is going to be associated with epsilon, uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of intermediary positions associated with some fraction of epsilon and some fraction of omega, and one position will only be omega. And so let's take our theoretical diagrams and line them up with our actual images of crystals. So if this summary makes sense to you, you're well on your way to understanding anisotropic materials. So starting with the upper row of images, when our plane polarized light is aligned with epsilon, we see that the calcite only shows one image, and this image is actually the extraordinary ray. We see that in our tourmaline, we're left with one of the pleochroic end member colors. Looking at the middle row, we see that when the plane polarized light aligns with neither epsilon nor omega, the light is actually going to be split into two beams vibrating in mutually perpendicular directions. We see this in our calcite with the two images of the O. And our tourmaline displays a color intermediary between the two end member colors. With our bottom row, we see that when our plane polarized light is aligned with omega, there is a single image in the calcite, and this corresponds with the ordinary ray, and our tourmaline is showing the other pleochroic end member color. So let's rotate our tourmaline now in plane polarized light with a newfound respect for why we're seeing the change in pleochroic color. So as we slowly rotate the tourmaline, you can imagine what is theoretically going on here. We started out in a position where we're only seeing the pleochroic color associated with light traveling through the tourmaline at refractive index omega. As the crystal slowly rotates, the fraction of light associated with omega decreases, and the fraction of light associated with epsilon increases. The color of the crystal gradually lightens until we make it all the way to where the color associated with epsilon begins to dominate and then we'll finally end up in a position to where we are only seeing light transmitted associated with epsilon. So we've gone over a lot, but now we actually have the theoretical background to understand what's going to happen to this mineral in cross-polarized light as well. So if you recall from our first video, cross-polarized light is when we take a polarizer and put it perpendicular to the polarization direction of our original light, which should result in not seeing much of anything. So let's reset our crystal to our initial orientation where we're looking at epsilon. And in fact, if I bring in a polarizer with the mineral in this orientation, we won't see much of anything. But here's the trick to this. If your mineral is in an orientation where either you see only epsilon or only omega, no light will be transmitted under cross polarization. But if we rotate the mineral to a position in which the plane polarized light is going to be split into a fraction of epsilon and a fraction of omega, you will be able to see light transmitted through the mineral. And the maximum amount of light seen will occur 45 degrees from either epsilon or omega. We'll just look at omega now under cross-polarization just to show you that yes, no light is indeed transmitted. So hopefully this video was helpful in understanding anisotropic materials so far. But going forward, we're going to add a whole variety of complications. Everything you've seen so far today has been heavily dependent upon the orientation of the minerals. And in fact, our tourmaline has one orientation in which it will behave like an isotropic substance. If we are looking down the crystal in this orientation, this is known as looking down the optic axis, which is a concept we'll discuss in detail in our next video. Currently, we've been looking down the plane of the A-axis of the tourmaline, but let's take a look down the C-axis now instead. So I'm going to stand the mineral on end now so that we're looking down the C-axis, and I want you to notice what color we're going to see. That looks an awful lot like the color we associated with omega earlier, the almost complete darkness. To be fair, the light does have to travel through a bunch more mineral in this orientation, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead with this spoiler and let you know that that is indeed omega. And as we rotate the crystal, we can see that uh, the color is not really changing at all in this orientation. It's pretty much stuck at omega. Let's bring in the polarizer now and see what happens. Yup, that's, uh, that's pretty dark there. Having uh, flashbacks to the isotropic video yet? So we'll just briefly revisit isotropic materials here with our fun new theoretical diagram. Basically, if there's only one refractive index in this view of the crystal, then you can't do any of the beam splitting, which leads to the fun effects like 
the transmission of light under cross polarizers. So let's do a wrap up of what we've learned today. Anisotropic minerals are going to be those minerals that are defined by multiple refractive indices. These different refractive indices cause light traveling through these anisotropic materials to split into two rays that vibrate in perpendicular direction. That is, unless you are looking down an optic axis. In plane polarized light, pleochroism is caused by the relative dominance of one of these rays over the other, which changes as we rotate the mineral. When our plane polarized light is aligned with a particular refractive index, we'll see a pleochroic end member color. However, because our plane polarized light is not reoriented in these positions, we also don't see any light transmitted when we cross the polarizers. We see the maximum transmission of light under cross polarizers at orientations 45 degrees from our pleochroic end member colors. This is where our plane polarized light is being evenly split between our two rays. So our next video is going to talk about how we can divide anisotropic materials into two subgroups. And the nomenclature we've used for the refractive indices is actually that associated with a subset known as uniaxial minerals. Uniaxial minerals are defined by two refractive indices, whereas there's also biaxial minerals, which are defined by three refractive indices. Uniaxial minerals will have one optic axis, whereas biaxial minerals will have two. We'll also flesh out concepts introduced in this video a bit more and have some fun playing around with some new minerals. Thanks for watching everybody, and have a nice day!